Hello, my name is Tim Armstrong. I'm a professor of modern literature at Roll Hoy, and I teach uh, modernism and American literature. I'm going to talk today about the poetry of the First World War in its broader cultural context. Um, I'm going to talk really about four main things uh, empire, the body, uh, men versus women, and mourning. And then I'm going to talk about a couple of particular poems and problems. So um, I want to begin with empire and also with the Boer War. Um, and the writer Thomas Hardy, who's the only major poet to write both about um, the Boer War and about the First World War. So in his Boer War poetry, he writes about the death of a drummer, Drummer Hodge, um, buried in, on the veldt and lying beneath the unfamiliar constellations, and meditates on that trope of death away from England and what that means. He also writes a poem, The Souls of the Slain, in which he imagines himself, or the observer, watching the dead, the ghosts of the dead, flow north from South Africa uh, across Portland Bill and back to England as they meditate on the meaning of their death. And both of those poems provide a kind of pattern for many First World War poems. Hardy also writes very successful First World World War poems, including a poem called The Pity of It, where he talks about the fact that in the country lanes of Dorset you can still hear people say things like ik vol, um, Germanic uh, phrases which suggest that the Germans are in fact our, our kinsmen. Um, and he meditates on the, the painful falling out between people in the same linguistic families. Um, again, some of the best First World War poetries actually meditate on the enemy in that way. So I think Hardy actually is a very influential poet um, in relation to war. So the Boer War is important, uh, partly because, as you know, the First World War is a, is a war of empire. Um, its origins are partly in a series of imperial rivalries and tensions, which include Anglo-French rivalries and things like the Fashoda incident. Um, and its popularity uh, is linked to those uh, imperial um, tensions and uh, to the nationalism that accompanies them. Um, from the late 19th century, the British press had tended to support um, uh, war very strongly in what was quickly labelled jingoism. Um, the Boer War was particularly significant there. It saw crowds in the street cheering at the relief of Maffa King and other events. Um, so despite the fact that the ideology that we inherit from the war poets is often that it was a betrayal of youth uh, by generals, by, by an older generation, politicians, um, it was an, an immensely popular war, um, as some of the early poetry of the war uh, tells us. The other thing about imperial rivalry that's important, I think, is, is the British uh, sense of decline, um, which begins to put uh, British masculinity in particular under pressure. Um, so, um, so a large number of the recruits for the Boer War, or, or potential recruits, were turned away, um, up to 60% according to the Interdepartmental Committee on Physical Deterioration, which reported in 1904. Um, and while you might think that that's just um, working class people who were ill-nourished and, and lived in, in cities, um, there was also a sense of eugenic crisis uh, attached to, to to the upper classes as well. Um, if British battles were were, were informed um, as the as the some of the ideology suggested a lot by, by what happened on the playing fields of Eton, um, the All Blacks toured from New Zealand in, in 1905 from a tiny country and defeated uh, everyone they faced. Um, and uh, that kind of failure of, of even of elite masculinity. Um, produced anxiety which feeds into uh, the First World War. So that's empire. Um, I also want to talk a little bit about uh, the masculine body uh, in relation to the war. Um, war is of course founded on notions of masculine prowess um, and the First World War was founded initially in a notion of that it would be over quickly, um, that, that technically enhanced um, mobility embodied in all those um, those mobilization plans and the Schlieffen plan and so on would produce a, a quick war. Um, what happened, of course, was trench warfare, uh, which is characterized by, um, by inaction, passivity, protracted shelling, um, the stench of corpses, and all those other things that we, we now know about. 
Um, and that produces a culture of trauma and wounding that affects almost all the early war poetry. Um, the vision of the mutilated body um, uh, that we get in, in artists and, and poets uh, of the period, and even in, in, in writers like uh, D.H. Lawrence, um, and also the trauma of shell shock. Shell shock is interesting, partly because the late 19th century had uh, typically uh, signed hysteria and mental breakdown, what was called neurasthenia, to women. When the, the war produced um, breakdown among men in, in large numbers, oft, often men who clearly weren't malingering, who had won medals for other actions, um, that in turn produces a kind of uh, crisis in masculine identity um, and a sense of pervasive trauma. And one aspect of the poetry um, is, is that sense of trauma, but also a kind of um, an immediacy and a fear of forgetting that you get in poems like Siegfried Sassoon's Aftermath, um, the, the fear of actually not, not recording and sustaining experience. Um, and I think I think the poetry is interesting in that respect. I mean, we we, we normally say that lyric um, is individual subjective experience, uh, a kind of release. Um, and it's you know notable that, that that more considered prose reflections on the First World War only come ten years later. Um, it's not until 1928 that you start to see all quiet on the Western Front. Goodbye to all that. Sassoon's memoirs and other prose texts. So lyric seems to deal with unprocessed experience which it wants to somehow store and contain, get down, but which contains um, things which can't easily be said, I think. Um, so the status of, of, of lyric in relation to that sense of bodily and psychic breakdown is interesting. The, the third topic I want to talk about is, is men and women. Um, now the war, because of all that trauma, produced a, a real rift between those at home and those in the trenches. Um, men were fighting for women, but they couldn't easily explain their experiences uh, when they returned on leave and so on, and, and, and in their writings. Um, and it was partly a difference between a, an old language of sacrifice and patriotism and service and, uh, and a new language which had invalidated really all those words and, and produced a, a harshness and a cynicism which couldn't readily be conveyed to those at home. Um, there are some exceptions, I think, with the poems like The Road by Sassoon. Um, women, of course, had their own experience of the war, and recent scholarship has, I think, done very good work in returning that experience to us. They, 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 worked, they, they wrote, um, they were ideologues, they were participants as nurses and ambulance drivers, um, but, and they also waited. So Rebecca West, The Return of the Soldier, her novella describes... Um, woman dealing with the, the kind of referred trauma of the war as, as a wounded soldier returns. Um, but nonetheless, the, the trenches do, does drive that, that wedge between men and women, and that can at times produce a kind of a gender um, hostility. It can also produce a sense of sort of masculinity as having to, to do different work in the trenches. So often you get a kind of tenderness between men uh, homoerotics at times, um, you get the domesticity of the trenches and so on. Um, one interesting aspect of tr the trenches was that there were gramophones everywhere up and down the, fr the front, the trench gramophones, playing popular songs and bringing, if you like, the living room into the trenches. Uh, so gender is important in that respect. Um, my fourth topic is mourning. The, the war produces maths death, um, uh, which spreads across the world, really. Um, uh, Britain, Ireland, Scotland, the whole of the Commonwealth, India, um, all those countries experienced huge numbers of deaths as a result of the First World War. I grew up in a small town in New Zealand where the local First World War memorial has 61 dead li listed, uh, and that would have been out of a population of fewer than a thousand people. I live now in the east end of London, we're nearby a cypress street which has its own memorial and there there's 26 deaths listed in a street of fewer than a hundred houses. So the dead are everywhere and the memorials of the First World War attempt to list all the dead um, and that's quite a new thing. Um, 
according to classical epics, the dead are innumerable. They're like the leaves of autumn. Um, they're, they're a mass. Uh, and that's true through to Milton, at least. Um, and again, you know, the dead of Waterloo are, aren't listed anywhere. Um, they're just buried there. Uh, unless they're, uh, they were officers or elite where they might have had a memorial in their local church. Um, the First World War produces a culture of memorialization that tries to list and enumerate all the dead, a process that I think begins with the American Civil War. It has really its end point in the Vietnam Memorial in Washington, which lists um, all the dead of the Vietnam War, all 50,000 of them uh, day by day. So, in a sense, mass deaths produces its own problem of, of, of how you deal with the individual death. And Freud um, uh, wrote in 1917 a famous paper called Mourning and Melancholia, where he tries to distinguish healthy mourning, which processes the dead, with the melancholic fixation on the dead, typified by Hamlet uh, in relation to his father. Um, but I don't think it's that easy. Um, the dead do haunt. They come back. Um, and, and have, to, have to be dealt with um, in, in, uh, in a disturbing way. Um, I want to finish by talking about two problems um, arising from all this in the poetry of the First World War. And one is that problem of the, of, of the one and the many, of individuation. Um, how do you deal with mass death? And there, the poem I'd refer to is um, Isaac Rosenberg's Dead Man's Dump, um, which you may know. And I think one of the interesting things about that poem is the, the personal pronouns. Um, that question of, of, uh, of we or them versus us. Um, at the beginning of the poem, the wheels lurched over sprawled dead. They don't even get an article. Um, their mouths, their shut mouths made no moan. Um, they lie there huddled, friend and foe man. Um, earth has waited for them. None saw their spirits shadow shake the grass. So really we're dealing with collectivities there. Um, uh, the poet asks, what of us? Um, uh, and again says, um, talks of the dark earth where, what, and says, what dead are born when you kiss each soundless soul? So collectivities. Um, but finally in the poem we come to individuation. We come to a man's brains splattered on a stretcher bearer's face. We come to they left this dead with the older dead. Um, so you're dealing with something that finally moves towards individuation. And then at the climax of the poem you have um, here is one not long dead. His dark hearing caught our far wheels. Um, and you have that sense of the, the world breaking over his sight. So you end finally with someone who's extracted from this morass of dead and older dead and treated as an individual even as he passes from the world. So the one and the many is a problem. And the other problem I'd point to is the problem of the other, um, which is present really in poems which deal with the enemy. The, the poem of encounter which you get in Hardy and in Owen um, and the example I want to talk about there, um, I have it here, is um, Siegfried Sassoon's um, uh, poem, um, uh, A Night Attack, um, which is based on uh, an account in his diary of the Battle of the Somme, where he says, um, uh, As I stepped over one of the Germans, an impulse made me lift him up from the miserable ditch. Propped against the bank, his blonde face was undisfigured, except for the mud, which I wiped from his eyes and mouth with my coat sleeve. He had evidently been killed while digging, for his tunic was knotted loosely about his shoulders. He didn't look to be more than eighteen. Hoisting him a little higher, I thought what a gentle face he had, and I remembered that this was the first time I would touched one of our enemies with my hands. Perhaps I had some dim sense of the futility which had put an end to this good-looking youth. Anyway, I hadn't expected the Battle of the Somme to be quite like this. And then the poem, which he didn't publish at the time, actually, partly because of its, I think, sympathy for the enemy. Um, uh, one of the main uh, texts on Sassoon describes this as a weak poem, but I think, um, in fact, its prosaic virtues are, are part of its power. Um, 
So in a night attack he says, One says the bloody Bosch has got the knock, and soon they'll crumple up and chuck their games. We've got the beggars on the run at last. Then I remembered something that I'd seen, dead in a squalid, miserable ditch, heedless of toiling feet that trod him down. He was a young Prussian with a decent face, young, fresh and pleasant, so I dare to say. No doubt he loathed the war and longed for peace and cursed our souls because we killed his friends. So in that poem of understanding, of touching, of intimacy, of dealing with the dead, I think um, you have one of the most powerful uh, senses of, 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 of of dealing with the, the, the problem of death, which is the death of everyone, of, of friend, of foe, and those with whom one will live after the war.